All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Pediatric Grand Rounds today. Our presenters are from the Department of Pediatric Endocrinology here at Carillion. Uh, Dr. Melissa Garganta is a graduate of USC for her medical training and residency. She completed her clinical fellowship in endocrinology at Vanderbilt University and has worked for many years in the PRISM Health System <clears throat> of South Carolina prior to joining Carillion in January of 2020. She has a special interest in bone metabolism, thyroid cancer, and the type 1 diabetes care. Our second presenter is Lori Wise. She's a graduate of Cabarrus College of Health Sciences, where she completed her RN and BSN. She went on to UNC Chapel Hill for her pediatric nurse practitioner uh, training. She's also worked for many years in the PRISM Health System in Charlotte. She has a special interest in the care of type 1 diabetes and was awarded the Community Championship Award by JDRF. She joined Carillion also in 2020. Please welcome Dr. Garganta and Lori Wise. Hi, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Janie, for that fantastic intro song. If anybody does know the artist, please type it in because I, I have no clue. Um, so this morning, we're going to talk about technology and specifically type 1 diabetes. Uh, we picked this topic because we found that a lot of the residents that rotate with us and just community physicians, a lot of the questions we tend to get about our patients who use different pumps, CGMs, different technology to take care of their diabetes. And it's a, a very sort of confusing topic and uh, there's a lot of different types. And we hope that you'll leave here with a little bit uh, better understanding of the options out there for our kids. Disclosures, we don't have any financial disclosures. Uh, we will be using company brand names of certain devices in order to differentiate the types. There's really no generic name for these these different types of, of pumps. So we will be using brand names for that, but no brand names of any medications will be used. Uh, you will see some brand names of historical medications that are no longer available in the, the history section. And we will be discussing only FDA approved current devices. Um, and that is out of just safety for our patients. There are a lot of other options out there you may see or hear about, but in, for the purposes of this talk, we'll just be discussing um, FDA approved options in this country. And we do have a lot of patient photographs that are all used with permission. Okay. Uh, by the end of this talk, uh, I hope you will be able to understand sort of the brief history of insulin and technology development for the treatment of type one and just understand how we've how far we've come in the past 100 years. I'm going to explain the difference between um, types of glucose monitoring and insulin insulin delivery systems that are currently available and also at the very end summarize how closed loop systems can work to effectively manage diabetes as this is what a lot of our patients are now transitioning to. Just very quickly, type 1 diabetes, uh, for the purposes of this talk, we're focusing just on type 1, not on type 2 or, or any other form of diabetes. There are over a million Americans living with this disease. About 200,000 of them are our patients in the, the pediatric population. About 18,000 new cases of type 1 diabetes are diagnosed each year, and it's estimated that each year there's about a 20% increase. So this is definitely a, a disease that we are seeing more frequently. Um, the only effective treatment for these patients is insulin. They're not able to take any other kind of medication to help with their condition. Uh, it's a very expensive disease to uh, treat for healthcare and for families. And it is a disease that uh, does tend to run in families. About 5% um, of our patients who have diabetes have either a parent or a sibling that also have type 1 diabetes. It isn't immune mediated most of the time. Um, about 5% of cases we do not find positive antibodies, but it's thought that maybe there's some antibodies that we have yet to identify. Uh, it's a process that results in destruction of a particular portion of the pancreas called the islet beta cell, uh, which is the cell responsible for producing insulin. So the, the end result of type 1 diabetes is insulin deficiency. It's a breakdown in the process of immune system self tolerance. So where the immune system is attacking self, and it's actually a prolonged process. By the time our patients are um, diagnosed, they've typically had high blood sugar for several months and the immune system breakdown itself has been going on 
up to years. We don't know the exact cause. There are several um, genetic um, predispositions, certain HLA haplotypes. There's some that thought that there's a link to the insulin gene, but we're not exactly sure uh, why some people get type 1 diabetes and others don't. Um, we think it's a combination of genetics and then some kind of environmental trigger, trigger that activates the immune response. Type 1 diabetes is an insulin deficiency, as I said, so there is no other treatment that's going to work for these children um, than insulin replacement therapy. Even if you did a pancreatic transplant, eventually they would still have type 1 diabetes due to the ongoing um, immune destruction of the cells. So unlike type 2 diabetes, where they actually have hyperinsulinism in a lot of cases and they are resistant to it, these patients um, have insulin deficiency and require insulin treatment for uh, to live. So I'm going to walk you through the, the first part of the last 99 years. And so what I want everyone to, to understand is that insulin was discovered in 1921. And so that's 99 years ago. And so prior to that, every patient with type 1 diabetes died. The only treatment for type 1 diabetes prior to the 20s was starvation. The children were basically fed sometimes less than 500 calories per day. Uh, limited to zero carb diet, and that bought them some time, but that was it. It was a very poor quality of life. They were quite sick, uh, very thin, and, and really just suffered. There was no, no way to help these people. And so I'm going to walk us through the discovery of insulin through the, the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, and explain how things have evolved. And then Lori Wise is going to take over and, and talk about our current technology. So most importantly, we're going to start with insulin. So insulin was discovered in 1921. We did know prior to this, uh, in the late 1800s, the, the pancreas was found to have different parts. So basically the islands, which we now know as the islets of Langerhans, but they were first called islands, were discovered. And over the next 20 years, they it was felt that there was some substance produced by these islands called insulin, um, which is after the, the Latin name um, for insula, for island, that was responsible for controlling carbohydrate metabolism. But that's pretty much all we knew. We didn't know how to get to it or what it really did. And then in 1921, these two gentlemen here, uh, Frederick Banting, who was actually a surgeon who had served um, overseas and then after the war came back to Toronto and was having trouble running a private practice in surgery. And so he took a research position at the University of Toronto. And then Charles Best, who was only 22, he was a medical student at the time. Um, they worked in a lab at the University of Toronto and Dr. Banting was interested in type one diabetes because he had a friend who passed away from it at age 14 and he, he saw her suffer and, and wanted to find a way to, to treat this disorder. And so they did research experiments on dogs, um, several dogs, their first 19 dogs um, passed away within uh, hours to days and they were very unsuccessful, but they kept going. And then Marjorie, that sweet pup there that you see on your screen is the very first diabetes patient who was treated with pancreatic extract. And so what they did is they took dogs, they removed their pancreases and made them diabetic. And then they took another group of dogs where they ligated the exocrine ducts of the pancreas so that basically the exocrine pancreas atrophied away. And so you had the endocrine pancreas remaining and they removed it, ground it up and injected it into the dogs that had had their pancreas removed. And Marjorie lived for 70 days um, and she was described as being healthy and active like a puppy, puppy. And unfortunately she passed away after that because they ran out of extract. She was the first successful patient to, to be treated with what would eventually be insulin. This is one of the first human patients to ever receive insulin. So Leonard Thompson was actually the first. He was a 14-year-old. There's not a lot of, of photographs of him available. This is probably the second or third um, young man to be treated. And you can see the picture before. Um, he was very cachectic and, 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 and sick and just dying. And then a few months later, after receiving um, basically ground up pancreas extract from cows, he is a thriving, healthy, plump little boy. So definitely life, life changing discovery. From there, things somewhat, you know, in the, in the realm of science anyway, rapidly progressed. Um, Banting and, and Best were really heralded as, as heroes as they are. Um, 
1923, the Nobel Prize was actually given to Banting and a Dr. McLeod, who is actually the the head of the, the lab. He wasn't really directly involved in the research, but he was the head of the lab. Poor Best got, got um, left out because he was a medical student. Um, but Dr. Banting gave him his prize money from the from the Nobel Prize because he did a lot of the hard day to day work. And then Dr. Collip is the one that discovered how to purify the extract, taking it from ground up pancreas sludge to to just the insulin component. And you can see another uh, the first female patient treated um, in that picture. They're also very cachectic and then a very healthy looking girl just a few a few months later. Um, the drawing there is one of the first pictures from Banting and Best Lab that that shows the the islands or islets of Langerhans. It's one of the first uh, published, and you can see the quote by Dr. Banting there: "Insulin does not belong to me; it belongs to the world." And Dr. Banting sold the patent for his um, insulin discovered. At this point, they were using cows bovine extract instead of dogs, but um, he sold it to the Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical Company for one dollar, so that. This cure, this cure, as they called it, would be available for all patients. This is the, the paper from Banting and Best that came out in 1922, um, describing the internal secretion of the pancreas and insulin. You see one of the very first vials of insulin here from the University of Toronto. It was 50 units per 5 cc, um, and basically it was, it was just ground up, somewhat purified um, cow pancreas, but it worked. From then on, uh, Lilly and the Novo and other companies at that point in time took over the, the process of manufacturing insulin. Uh, they discovered it was easier and cheaper to make from pigs. And so all insulin was, was porcine in nature for, for many years. And it took approximately seven pounds of pig pancreas to make one vial of islatin, which is what um, and Lilly branded their, their first types of insulin. So um, very long, gross, to be honest with you, process to, to make this. And um, at the top right of the screen was a display in the, from uh, Eli Lilly that explained how the islatin was made and the multi-step process that it was purified and basically transitioned from a brown liquid to a somewhat clear liquid. And at the bottom of the screen is the first ever prescription form of uh, insulin that was available. Uh, with a reusable syringe that patients were to wash and boil at home and a needle that you sharpened yourself at home. Um, so very, very barbaric compared to what we do now. After uh, the initial discovery, uh, there was a fairly rapid progression in the evolution of insulin. So 1921 through the late 1970s, all insulin was bovine or porcine in origin. So we did not know how to make human insulin yet. Um, it was not until 78 that the first strand of recombinant human insulin was manufactured. And so what um, scientists started doing was experimenting with insulin itself on how to make it work longer or shorter or um, faster. And so 1936 was sort of a, one of the biggest breakthroughs in discovering what we now know as NPH insulin. And so they <laughs> uh, discovered that the effect of insulin could last longer. So the regular insulin only lasts about four to six hours. And so they found they could get it last, to last up to 12 hours in the system if they added protamine, which is obtained from milt or semen of river trout. And I have no idea what inspired somebody to try that, but uh, I'm glad they did. And I'm glad we no longer sourced the protamine from there, but uh, it was brought to a, a neutral pH for injection so that it was not painful. Uh, and in 1950, they manufactured this as what we now know as NPH, so neutral protamine hagedorn, and Dr. Hagedorn is the one that discovered this, so that is what NPH stands for. And then in the 80s, pretty much all um, insulin transitioned to being made using recombinant human DNA and bacteria, and so uh, porcine insulin sort of fell out of favor, which was good. A lot of people had uh, allergic reactions to, to the animal-based insulin. Um, and so in the 80s, we had we had N and R insulin to, to manage diabetes. And so now insulin is made um, from recombinant DNA using either E. coli or yeast. And it basically, they take the human insulin gene, um, put it in a bacteria that will rapidly produce it, and then wash um, away um, the rest of the solution, in, including the bacteria, and you have pure uh, sterile recombinant human insulin. 
So now that we have good human insulin, the next step over the probably the last 20 to 30 years has been altering the insulin molecule to make it do different things, whether substituting an amino acid, adding a particular protein, changing the pH, different ways of manipulating this molecule to make it work more rapidly um, and last longer. So now, today, we have a slew of insulin options um, that have a duration of action ranging from a couple hours all the way to more than 24 hours so that we can effectively match insulin needs to our patient's diet, activity, and growing needs. So just to kind of recap on insulin, um, we went from less than 100 years ago to in 1921 and 22, the discovery of insulin um, to the first commercial insulin in 23. So life changing patients that died were now able to live to using um, in all the way to the 70s where all of our insulin was animal based. Human insulin starting in the 80s, our modern insulins in the 90s and early 2000, and now they're you know, ongoing um, studies to make even better insulins, even, even more treatment options, um, a lot that we are, aren't available to us in pediatrics, but hopefully they are coming. So now we have the insulin, so how are we going to get it into the patient? So initially, this is what we had was a very scary, barbaric looking syringe. <laughs> It was glass with a um, reusable needle that was boiled and sharpened. Um, in 1925, the Novo syringe was marketed as the first insulin specific syringe. It had this very large needle and a, a metal uh, plunger that, that screwed on, um, but it was available for use at home. And then in 1932 was the first automatic injector, um, which um, looks quite terrifying actually, but basically you loaded the insulin, dialed it up, pressed the button and it uh, rapidly injected the insulin um, into the skin. Disposable syringes did not come out until the 1960s. These were still glass, but at least the needles were no longer reused. Um, so you could um, use a different syringe for each injection. These are just some historical photos of, of kids injecting their own insulin um, with very, very big, scary needles, but doing it and, and doing a great job. Modern syringes, what we have now, what you guys see in the hospital and in use every day, they're all plastic, they're disposable, they're single use and sterile. Um, the, they're small now as a 31 gauge by four to six millimeters. So very, very tiny needle compared to the hypodermic that you saw on the previous slides. And they hold differing amounts of insulin and some of them are even small enough that they have half unit markings for our younger patients. We also use insulin pens. The first insulin pin, insulin pin came out in 1985, and it did have disposable needles, so they were quite long, um, and cartridges that you that you replaced. Um, pins have rapidly evolved. You can see in this other picture, these are these are all pins that are no longer um, manufactured, but have evolved over the years. Different types. Everyone has tried, you know, different mechanisms, but um, overwhelmingly, this is this is pretty standard of care for most of our new onsets. They're all given insulin pins. Very rarely does a patient use vials and syringes anymore. Modern insulin pins can be refillable or disposable. The needles are as small as four millimeters, as you see in that picture, so very tiny, not painful at all. Um, the insulin does not need to be refrigerated in these pins once they're open. And there's even smart pin options now that have Bluetooth and memory to help keep track of dosing. The first insulin pump uh, is pictured here. You can see it's huge. It was in 1963. It was about the size of a microwave. You had to wear it as a backpack, and it required venous access. So basically, you were walking around with an IV in a backpack. So you can imagine this did not really become commercially available, but in the research setting, this was a huge breakthrough. Insulin pumps rapidly evolved after that as well um, from the 70s, where it was very much like a small IV pump that you would wear. Um, to the 80s, where it was still quite large, but much, much more portable, and you could actually program it um, to give varying amounts of insulin rather than a steady infusion. And then you can see in the picture at the top, the pump from the early 80s, um, similar to, to what we have now, but still basically a, just a compact IV pump that you could dial the rate on with a needle that you basically just put in the skin and then taped down. So not very sterile, a little bit higher risk of skin um, and site infections. And then over the 90s, pumps got smaller and smarter um, to where they could change rates. They could um, uh, do basically the, the bolus calculations for you. 
they were less intrusive, they were um, battery powered and the battery would last longer. Um, so just, just a gradual decrease in size and increase in function. Insulin pumps in the 2000s um, were much smaller. The sites were much better to reduce infection and skin irritation. Of course, they came in fabulous colors that kids like. And then um, the first tubeless pump, as you can see there is the early, early pod pump, um, which essentially worked the same way, but worked via um, a radio signal from a controller so that the patient did not have to have a tube going from the skin to the pump itself. So basically all insulin pumps work at a, at a basic level the same way uh, where you have an infusion set and a cannula that goes in the skin and then a pump that has um, an algorithm or a program to deliver a set amount of insulin that we program that it either goes through a tube or the insulin pump itself sits on the skin and it's operated by a remote controller. So we know how to give insulin. We have lots of ways to do it, but how do we know how much to give. And so home glucose testing is probably one of the most interesting things I think that have changed in the last few years. So um, initially there was really no way to test glucose at home. The patients were just given basically enough insulin to keep them alive and keep them fairly healthy. In the forties, they developed the clinitest, which was a, a urine test for checking blood sugar at home. And so basically you had to pee in a tube and then add this tablet that had a copper region in it and it uh, reacted and turned a color. And the color produced by the heat reaction corresponded to an estimated blood sugar. These were highly poisonous if ingested uh, and very, very cumbersome, but it was really all they had for a long time to monitor glucose at home. Then the first glucometer um, came out. Um, this is in the early 1960s. Um, it was three pounds and cost $650. So this was really marketed more for physicians offices, not so much for home use. Um, but you would poke your finger and put a fairly large amount of blood on a, on a dexter sticks and it would change to a certain color of blue. You would put the strip in this reflectance meter and um, the needle uh, would re correspond to the reading of the intensity of the blue light. And that would give you a, um, a blood sugar uh, reading and it can took up to five minutes for a single single reading. So thankfully, we rapidly over the 70s and 80s, um, now to more current glucometers um, have become smaller, require a much smaller blood sample. They all have digital readouts now um, instead of a, a, a radio needle, which is which is good. And they are much more rapid, um, giving readings in 30 seconds often. Um, so much, much easier to use, much portable. They can be rechargeable or hold batteries, lots of different options. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lori Wise so she can talk about um, what our patients actually use now and, and hopefully um, give you guys a better idea of what we do on a day to day basis. All right, guys, so I'm going to talk about today's insulin pumps and CGMs. Um, these are things that you're going to be seeing if you come through our clinic or work in the hospital. Um, there are multiple options um, available, so I'm just going to kind of walk you through what you're going to see. Um, starting with continual glucose monitoring, um, the picture is of a little boy looking at a year's worth of test strips. Um, and so a lot of our patients opt early on to move from um, blood glucose testing to um, continual glucose monitoring. Um, we have several, we have Dexcoms, um, Freestyle Libres, and the Medtronic Guardian sensor, and I'm going to walk through each of these in the next slides. Um, how they work, basically each CGM has three components. Um, the sensor is actually what sits under the skin and measures the glucose of the interstitial fluid. Um, the transmitter is attached to the sensor, and it is what sends the data to the receiver. The receiver is either a handheld device um, that is separate, or it can also be a um, like an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, there are apps and that will actually um, help a lot of our teenagers and also families of young children. Um, I'm gonna talk about how these CGMs can be used in remote monitoring later on as well. Um, one thing to remember is that sensor glucose will be different from blood glucose. So if you are looking at a sensor glucose and you check a blood glucose, they will there will be um, a little bit of lag time, especially if you are treating a low blood glucose. So we do recommend that our children um, check their blood sugar when treating a low by finger prick because if they wait and go off of only the sensor data, they will actually over treat. 
Um, there are also trend arrows with the CGMs. That is one of the most beneficial parts. Um, the trend arrows, which I'll show in the next slide, help us know whether the glucose is rising, falling, or steady. Each CGM, whether it's a Dexcom, um, a Guardian, or a Libre, have arrows. The arrows have slightly different meanings. Um, they differ between devices. So it's just important to know that they are different um, as people use these arrows to make blood glucose management decisions on a fairly frequent basis. There are actually some um, endocrine standards regarding how to use these arrows, like pre-exercise and um, just in pre-meal um, bolusing as well. There are some pictures of the CGMs um, on the top. There is the Dexcom. Um, actually, both of the larger pictures are of the Dexcom systems. Um, the Libre is actually the blue meter with the um, round. It's about the size of a quarter um, sensor. And then the smaller picture at the bottom is actually the Medtronic Guardian sensor that works with the Medtronic pumps. There, here is a comparison chart. I'm not going to go through all of this um, data. I will go through some on each of the next few slides. Um, but there's actually one new um, glucose monitor um, CGM that's come out called the Libre 2 that's kind of exciting in the pediatric world. We just learned about it last week. Um, it's literally just out this month, um, and I'll be talking about that as well. Um, the Dexcom G6. Um, so. The whole system that it kind of looks like the first picture there on the slide, um, there is a picture of someone actually inserting the sensor. So the sensor comes attached to the inserter. Um, the inserter is quite large. It is not reusable. Um, they do have to either throw it away or they can recycle it. Um, that's a question we get a lot because it is quite bulky, but it does make insertion of the sensor very easy and very little pain. Um, they throw away the um, inserter and what's left is actually on the bottom picture you see sort of the sticker, the white sticker with um, the clear in the middle. That is actually the sensor that will stay on their skin. There's a little filament that goes beneath the skin that reads the glucose and that will stay on the skin for 10 days. Then the transmitter is the gray um, kind of oval shaped item that is being put on top of the sensor. That is what then transmits the data to the handheld receiver that you see in the top picture or the um, phone that you see in the last picture. Um, also on this picture, you do see the arrows. So the um, on the iPhone, you see the 202 and it has a arrow pointing slightly up. That tells them what their glucose is at this moment, as well as where it's going to be in the next 15 to 30 minutes. They also get a graph at the bottom of the screen, and that graph can change to be from the last one hour to the last six or eight hours. You can turn the phone and get a whole last 24 hours of readings, um, but very helpful. Um, as you can imagine, you know, if you see a blood glucose of, of 120, but your child's going to bed and the arrow is pointing down, you're going to go ahead and treat that. Um, you know, If you don't have a CGM and their blood sugar is 120, we would tell you to let it ride. So it does definitely help um, make some decisions at meal times, bedtimes, with exercise, et cetera. Um, Dexcom trend arrows, um, basically they have you know, one arrow up, two arrows up, or one or two arrows down. Um, an arrow to the side means they're steady. This is something you'll see quite frequently. We do see, um, we do use a lot of Dexcoms. Um, it is very, they're, they're pretty expensive. Um, so we do rely on insurance coverage for that. Um, G5 is the older model that's being phased out, and G6 is the current model. Dexcom G6 does work with the T-Slim pumps. Um, it can also work alone, so we do have kids on injections using the Dexcom um, and other pumps. They may opt to use the Dexcom as well. Um, it does measure the interstitial glucose, and it provides updated readings every five minutes to the phone or receiver. Um, the, one of the most important things about this is that you can set high and low alerts, and these can be individualized for each individual patient, um, except for the urgent low is always set at 55 and you cannot change that. 
Um, but and they also have rise and fall rates that can be utilized um, if they're rising or falling at a rate of uh, more than two or three milligrams per minute. I will say that we often turn these off on a lot of our teenagers because they can get very tired of alarms. And I would rather them be reacting to those highs or lows um, and not worry as much about the rise and fall. Oh, yes, I have to tell you that. So the, the koala there is actually wearing a Dexcom. His name is Quincy and he lived in the San Diego Zoo. Um, and they actually monitored his glucose because it was easier to use a CGM than to prick his ear every time they needed to know his glucose. Um, and so they actually were able to tell when he needed a shot of insulin. Um, and he was actually in the Sandy, I think he wore it for a few years. Um, he has passed away, but it was not from diabetes. <laughs> um, the Dexcom also, when they come into our clinic, we can actually download the Dexcom. Um, we also can, they can share um, basically to a cloud and we can remotely monitor their glucose. So we do have families that will call in and say they've been running high or low, and we can actually look online and you know visualize what their glucose has been doing. Um, the graph, um, the first graph under the title just shows daily readings. So we can look at day to day um, over a 12 hour period, or at the top, we can actually look at like a two week or 30 day or 90 day um, overview which I think speaks volumes. I, I like to use that a lot and show the families. Um, and you can see like what the trend is that specifically this person kind of runs high all the time, but they definitely have a spike after breakfast. So it helps us really make some insulin adjustments and pump adjustments. Um, it also gives us what their average blood glucose has been over that same 14, 30 or 90 day period, as well as how many lows in range and highs they have. Um, this specific one does show a very large amount of low blood sugars in the red, um, and it does let us know that they're at high risk for a severe hypoglycemic event. So very helpful downloads. Um, families can also see this on their phone. There is a Dexcom Clarity app. Um, it will also now give us an estimated um, A1C, which is really pretty close to what we would measure in our clinic or at the lab. The next um, CGM is the Guardian. That is, this is the one that works with the Medtronic pumps. Um, it only works with Medtronic 630 and 670 insulin pumps. Um, it does work with them helping to suspend before low, and it works within the 670 in like a hybrid closed loop system, which I'll talk to a little bit more later. Um, again, their trend errors with Medtronic are different. Um, you can see on the pump picture that you have a glucose on the pump itself, along with two, like a double arrow down. So this is um, falling pretty rapidly. There is also a Freestyle Libre CGM, and there's actually two models of this now available in the United States. Um, there is the traditional Libre and then the Libre 2. Um, basically, this is a 14-day system. So they put the round sensor on is about the size of a quarter very easy to apply, usually on the upper arm. It can stay on for 14 days and they actually scan over the sensor with a reader. Um, and you, you, it reads in a matter of seconds, it will read through clothing. Um, the issue with this one, there's, well, there's two different types. The traditional type is approved only for 18 years and up. It is much less expensive than the Dexcom. And so we do have some families that will opt to pay out of pocket for this device. It's usually 30 to $60 per sensor. Um, the reader is additional um, on top of that cost. There is a 14 day wear. It is a scan system. You do not receive any alerts of high or low glucose like you do with the Dexcom. You scan and you will get the data that you see there in the picture, a blood glucose, or I'm sorry, a sensor glucose, as well as an arrow telling you if you're rising, falling, or steady, and then a graph at the very bottom. You do have to scan the sensor every eight hours in order for it to really keep full data. Um, if you do not, you will see some gaps in the download or the graph. Um, we can download this at the office, or we can also remotely view this um, through the Libre um, link um, or Libre view system. 
The Libre 2 is the one that is brand new as of this month. It is approved for ages four and up. So this is gonna be um, a great option for our younger patients um, that maybe the insurance does not cover other sensors as well. It is a 14 day wear, same look, still the size of a quarter. Um, it You do have to scan. You do not get live data without a scan. Um, you do set alerts, so it will alert you if a blood glucose is under a set level or above a set level. However, it alerts you and you still need to scan with the sensor, I'm sorry, the reader. Um, we can as well um, view this remotely or download in our office. There is going to be a phone app that you can use for scanning, um, which I think would be great, especially for our teenage population. Um, that app is available with the Freestyle, the, the Freestyle Libre, the first version, um, but it is not FDA approved for this yet, but it is under review. They're expecting it to be um, hopefully in the next month or so. Libre Trend Arrows, again, um, just know that each one is different. Um, this one does just has um, single arrows. Libre view. This is just an example of what we see when we download it. Um, we get a lot of data, just like we do with the Dexcom Clarity downloads. We can see a graph of the last, you know, day by day. We can also see a graph over the last two weeks um, and 30 days, 90 days. Um, the amount of data really is dependent on the amount they scan. If they're not scanning frequently, we're going to have big holes in, in the data and it's not going to be as helpful, of course. We also can see how much their um, percentage of time in target range, high or low. Um, and it does give us what it, like the average glucose of the patient. Um, again, not, er not all errors are the same. And so with each device, the patient and family just really need to understand what those arrows mean. Um, over time, the families will learn, you know, how to adjust insulin. So, you know, if someone is rising before exercise, you know, should they treat that? Should they not? There's actually some great, great handouts that we can give to families to let them know, you know, what the recommendations are. Everybody is so different with their glucose needs, though, um, especially with Size that most people learn, you know, what they need and can use the trend errors to kind of help make, you know, spur the moment decisions. And one of the most popular things about CGM use, especially in the pediatric population, is remote monitoring. Um, this can be done with or without the pumps, um, but basically both the Dexcom and Medtronic sensors at this time use remote monitoring. The Libre 2 um, is something that they are working towards. But basically, the child wears the sensor and has to carry a smart device as their receiver. And then they can share their data with up to, I believe it's like five to 10 individuals at this point. And so a parent can have a follow app on their phone and see what the child's glucose is at any given time. And they're going to see those trend arrows and be able to set alerts up for them as well. So overnight, it is very, very helpful for a lot of our parents of young children to have this. I think that they sleep better knowing it's there. Um, and so that is something that we get asked about a lot and a lot of young families get started on CGM early because of this feature. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna go to is just pumps. And I know Melissa went through kind of how pumps work as well, um, but briefly the insulin pump is basically um, kind of a, a microcomputer and it provides a constant basal rate of insulin. I describe it as sort of a drippy hose. Um, it's at a predetermined rate that is going to replace the long acting insulin that the child is on. Um, and then whenever they eat or have a high sugar, they communicate that with the pump and the pump will deliver a bolus dose um, instead of having to take a separate shot. Um, basically, the pump um, can, it, it uses an infusion set um, that is placed, usually it's replaced every two to three days, but it's a small cannula under the skin and it can be connected to the pump um, through a tube or it can actually be part of the pod pump, which we'll look at in a moment. We um, in Pete Endo set the rates of the pump. Um, we set up the basal rate or the constant drip, drip, drip um, infusion that will take the place of the long acting basal insulin. 
um, we set carb ratios and we set a correction factor in target, which will replace the sliding scale. Um, pumps do require patient input multiple times a day. And so, um, unfortunately, it is not place a pump and diabetes is made instantly easier. Um, it does require ongoing monitoring and um, they have to interact with that pump at least four or more times a day to be um, well managed. Pros and cons. Um, so, you know, we think of, of pumps as a very helpful thing and, and we definitely use a lot of them here in Pete Endo. They can give very small exact and small doses for carbs and high blood glucose. Um, we can give, you know, a half unit on a syringe, but we can give, you know, 0 0.01 of a unit um, on some of the pumps. There is less risk of hypoglycemia in studies. Um, basal rates can be changed hourly if needed for more precise insulin delivery. Um, most of our kids don't have more than five different basal rates. We don't find that they're super helpful to, to have more than that. Um, insulin can be suspended or temporarily um, decreased or increased due to illness or menses, exercise. Um, and we get a lot of data on the downloads of these pumps for review. Um, cons, there is an increase for DKA because these children are only using the more rapid acting insulins. They don't have that basal there um, as a safety net, that like long acting insulin. They do have to wear a pump 24 seven and some of our teenagers are, are kind of opposed to having something on their body. Um, it's a visual sign of diabetes. Again, teenagers will say, I don't want people asking about this. I don't want people saying, what is that? You know, do you have diabetes? Um, the, you know, they do have to consider what type of pump that they would like. Some of that is driven by insurance coverage, but basically the big decision is, do you wanna have a tubed pump versus a non-tubed pump? Um, then cost is also, um, some of the pumps can be up toward $8,000. Um, you're talking about initial cost of the initial um, pump and supplies, as well as a monthly cost for the um, sites and the tubing. Um, so it can be quite pricey. Um, what pumps are available? We have, a, we have Omnipod pumps, Tandem pumps, and Medtronic pumps. These are the three that you're going to see most um, here in the, the pediatric realm and here with our patients at Carillion. Um, Omnipod has two options. They have a traditional, um, and then they have come out with something that is um, the, called a dash, and the dash is a touchscreen version. These are both um, tubeless. So they actually wear the pod that you see in the picture that is filled with up to 200 units of insulin and it is placed on the body every three days. After three days, that pod expires, they have to change it. Um, this is kind of nice because you know that they're going to be replacing and moving that pod every three days. Um, the other picture shows what is called the PDM, which stands for Personal Diabetes Manager. I call it the remote control, honestly, with most of our kids. Um, in this traditional Omnipod, that is also the glucose meter. So they actually put a strip at, in at the bottom of that PDM and it works as their glucometer. They do not have to use that. They can manually tell this pump what their blood sugar is and when they eat um, and it will communicate um, to the pod and dose. The pod does have to be within six feet of that PDM for it to give bolus doses when they eat. But for the basal rate, it actually works independent. So they can be without that PDM and still get that constant basal rate. Um, the other Omnipod system, which is a little newer, is called the Dash. Um, it is, it again has the PDM, um, but, and it's the remote control. It works by Bluetooth. This one does not have an integrated meter. So they actually can use the Contour Next meter that comes with it. Um, or often these kids are using CGM and just will type in what their sugar is on their um, CGM before eating. Um, this one has to be within 20 foot feet of a pod to communicate. Um, it's working by Bluetooth and the basal rate is constant after the insertion um, of, or placement of the pod and insertion of the cannula and the PDM does not have to remain close um, for it to operate and deliver basal insulin. Um, these pods are, they look exactly the same. Um, they actually just have a blue cannula instead of a clear cannula. They hold 200 units of insulin and expire in three days as well. This is only approved in children two years and older. 
Um, I will say that a lot of our um, kids on pumps, we we do write off label for some of the pumps um, with because of the age re requirements or recommendations. So you may see some younger children than that um, utilizing this system. Medtronic insulin pumps. Um, this is a brand that has been around for a very long time. Um, the little boy here at the bottom of the screen is actually holding um, up to about a year of supplies. You can't see them all. Um, tubing sites um, that he's used for his Medtronic pump. Um, the 530G is one that you're still going to see occasionally. It is not something that we um, are, are using much anymore, but we still have a few patients on it. Um, this is one that can be used with or without a guardian sensor. Um, and it can, if used with the guardian sensor, can stop insulin for up to two hours if it is reading a low or a low is predicted. This is one that we can download using CareLink software. The newer versions of the Medtronic are the 630 and 670G. The 630G is um, actually only approved for ages 14 years and older. We do have younger kids on this pump. It is a tubed pump. It does have a full color screen and used with the Guardian sensor. It can suspend insulin if a low is predicted. Um, and if it, they choose not to use the sensor with the pump, it's just going to work like a insulin pump delivering basal and bolus insulin. Um, it does work with a linking contour next meter. Um, and we download this in clinic um, on the CareLink, CareLink software as well. The newest Medtronic is called the 670G. This is also termed the hybrid closed loop system. Um, this uses the Guardian sensor and it will actually decrease or suspend it basal insulin um, if a low is predicted based on its internal algorithm. And it will also ramp up basal insulin to try to prevent um, hyperglycemic excursions. Um, it will also work just as a traditional pump without the sensor. Um, you do have to calibrate this system. Um, it's, it's recommended at least two glucoses daily, but we find three to four glucoses work better to keep it functioning in that hybrid closed loop where it's kind of delivering insulin based on sensor data behind the scenes. Um, if you are not in auto mode, you're going to have it functioning like a traditional pump and you're having to enter um, carbs, correction, um, blood sugar data. It also links to the contour next meter and you can see in the top picture just how the, the setup looks with the guardian sensor um, as well as the pump setup um, there on the abdomen. The T slim pumps, there are two of these, um, the T slim with the basal IQ. Um, this is for use in ages six and older. Um, we do have some children using it younger. This is a tube pump. It is touch screen and full color screen. Um, this is also the only um, rechargeable um, insulin pump. The other ones did use batteries. Um, and this works with the Dexcom G6, and this stops the insulin when the glucose is dropping to try to prevent hyper, excuse me, hypoglycemia. And then the newest version is the T-Slim with Control IQ. Um, this is the same exact pump appearance um, as with Basal IQ. This pump is unique in that you can actually download new software so generally when a patient gets a pump, they have the pump for four years before the insurance will upgrade it. Um, this one is one that as new software comes out, they can actually plug into their computer and download new software. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so our patients can upgrade to the Control IQ. It works with the Dexcom G6, but this one will also um, increase and decrease um, insulin to try to prevent hypo or hyperglycemia and will bolus um, once an hour on its own if someone is hyperglycemic to try to bring it down. Um, it does still require user input for carbs and correction. Um, again, approved for ages six and up and they must use about 10 units of insulin daily for the algorithm to work. It can work without the sensor. It would just, again, uh, be a traditional pump with the basal settings and um, they would have to input carbs and blood sugar for correction. This chart just kind of goes through um, each pump and kind of what the differences are. Um, um, other than the Omnipod, the tube pumps usually hold a little bit more insulin. Um, they use different infusion sets um, depending on the brand of pump that you use. They have different basal ranges. So some of them can actually go down to a smaller basal dose. So that might be good for some of the 
toddlers. Um, and they also have different bolus ranges, which can be important to, to some of our teenagers who may actually bolus up to 25 or 30 units at, for a meal. Um, they, you know, are compatible with the different CGMs as we discussed. Um, pump downloads, this is something that's really important in our clinic. Um, and we download the pump at each visit. Um, we usually get a log book so we can see sort of what the blood sugars have been running. Um, the pump settings will also download. The log book will not only tell us blood glucose levels, but also what kind of carbs are they entering and how much insulin are they getting daily by basal and by bolus. We wide variety of charts and graphs, and it just helps us know how the kids are doing and helps us make adjustments. Um, some of the downloads will also combine the pump data and the sensor data, which can be very helpful right here. Is there a role for CGM in the initial eval for type two? Um, that's a great question. So uh, somewhat, uh, yes, um, a lot of the times cost is what prohibits that. Um, it's very difficult, unfortunately, in pediatrics to get CGMs covered for diagnosis other than type one. Um, at times it, it, it just requires a, a lot of paperwork and sometimes it's denied. Um, there is a, an option to use something uh, called a Libre Pro, um, which is basically uh, an office version of the the CGM where you can uh, apply to the patient, they wear it for three days, they don't see any readings or or have um, any idea what's going on, but they bring it back and we download it and can see. Um, we use that more, um, honestly, when we're we're concerned about um, poor control, just to, you know, um, in patients who aren't already on CGM. Um, for type two in our population, usually it's, um, so basic C peptide insulin level, blood sugars, and then a, and often an oral glucose tolerance test. But hopefully, you know, as CGMs become become more readily available, they will become more affordable, and that would be a good option. Um, and then also, is it a, a role for CGM evaluating the tired teenager whose parent is worried about low sugar? Goodness, we get a lot of a lot of those. We call them spells. So. Um, <laughs> Evaluation for spells. So, unfortunately, the CGMs are are, are wonderful, but um, you know, gold standard is always going to be the, you know, at least for now, the finger stick, blood sugar, and the CGMs. The um, the reliability of them actually decreases at at very low blood sugar readings, and so um, they may display a low, but um, it's it's difficult to know if that's a, a a true low in a patient who does not have diabetes, and so. I've used them a few times um, in younger kids where I'm worried about hyperinsulinism or, or, or something like that. But typically in a, a teenager, um, we try to avoid giving them blood sugar ways to check blood sugar at home because they mm -hmm. they tend to get really concerned if they see a 65, which is completely normal fasting in a person. Um, but so I'm, I'm not using a CGM for that. I have used a glucometer to evaluate that along with with some other other labs. 